A very good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Chetan Rawadapalli, consultant in interventional and transplant pulmonologist from Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad. And on behalf of Heart and Lung Transplant Department of Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad, I welcome you all to the second episode of our webinar series on Heart and Lung Transplant. And today we'll be discussing on the first and most important step in a lung transplant program that is about choosing a donor. And the moment you get a call that there is a donor, the first question that strikes in is this a suitable donor? Are we accepting the lungs? So let's see what our speaker and expert, expert panelists have to say on this. And to talk on ideal lung donor and the challenges in India, we have uh, today's speaker, Dr. Manjanath Parisar, who is consultant in robotic and minimally invasive thoracic surgeon from Yashoda Hospital, Sikindabad. And we also have two eminent expert panelists. Uh, I welcome Dr. K. V. Rajsekhar Rao, sir, who is the chief cardiothoracic and transplant surgeon from Care Hospitals, Nampalli, Hyderabad. And I also welcome Dr. Ashish Madkekar, sir, who is assistant professor and senior consultant cardio cardiothoracic surgeon from UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology and Research Center, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. So over the next few minutes, we will be discussing about ideal lung donor and challenges in India. And I request Dr. Manjanath Bhale, sir, to uh, speak on this topic. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ketan. And uh, I also welcome uh, uh, Dr. Ashikar and Dr. Ashish for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for your presence, sir. Today, I'll just speak. Uh, uh, sorry for some disturbances in the airport. I'm, I am just like, I came to the airport and I have to speak here because I have no other choice tonight. I'm very sorry for that, but please bear with me for that. Uh, I will just try to see what are the challenges we are facing in India in terms of our donors and what all steps we can take to uh, improve the donor selection and donor identification. So first I'll uh, try to brief you about uh, the ideal scenario. That's an ideal uh, donor. How an ideal donor, what an ideal donor constitutes of. The first, first and most important thing when we look at a donor is what is the age of the patient? Whether the age of the donor is 55 years or less, generally it's taken to be a good one. But when there, there are uh, latest studies also showing that any age between 18 to 55 are good, less than 18 and more than 65 are actually considered to be uh, high risk for uh, PGD as well as one year mortality. So the next uh, important uh, aspect is whether the patient is brain dead donor or a cardiac dead donor. Brain dead donors do better. They are the ideal donors. Then ABO, incomp ABO compatibility, clear uh, chest X-ray and the most uh, important uh, variable or the objectively, objectively looked at the criteria is the uh, PF ratio. That is, uh, uh, how much is it? Is it less than 300 or more than 300? Generally, more than 300. Uh, if it's more than 300, then it is considered to be uh, suitable for donation. If it's, more under, if, the, if it's more than 400, then it is ideal. So, if the uh, uh, PO2 by FO2, FO2 ratio is more than 300, they are considered as an ideal donor. Then uh, smoking history is generally a very gray zone because many of uh, the uh, transplant teams think that taking a patient of a, who was previously smoking is a bad thing. Uh, and in India, especially the kind of history they give is very sketchy because no one comes up and says, okay, this guy smokes 20 because they are very protective about their family members. They say, okay, he smokes occasionally or rarely, unless he's like an avid smoker, they don't come up with the right uh, words to describe their uh, smoking habits. So any uh, smoking history of less than 20 years, 20 pack years is considered to be okay. And uh, especially when you look at uh, the smoking history and the PO2 ratios are good, then we generally consider it to be okay for, for, for him to donate the lungs. Then uh, absence of uh, chest trauma is an ideal scenario. But we always see that uh, with the with the, with the uh, head injury, you'll have some associated uh, chest trauma. Sometimes maybe not significant, but sometimes significant based on the uh, uh, magnitude of the trauma. So that is one thing. Then on uh, uh, the every uh, patient we are uh, uh, selecting as a donor for a prospective donor, we do a CT scan to see if there are any signs of uh, aspirations. Or are there any signs of atelectasis? Atelectasis is generally not considered a contraindication for transplant because it is a very treatable condition. Generally, it is due to some mucus plug. And generally, when we uh, when we go for the retrieval, when we give when we uh, pull the lung out, we ventilate and see how is it. 
and generally they are very good even if there's a minor to mild uh, atelectasis one is not bothered this scenario is more commonly seen in obese patients where we uh, you definitely see some basal atelectasis we may see it bilaterally but in those cases when you open the chest up and when we try to recruit them through valsalva we see that the lung was not it was just uh, collapsed due to poor effort and poor uh, ventilatory mechanics and rather than the underlying lung condition so one has to be uh, very wary of uh, rejecting a lung just because purely because of atelectasis we can take those lungs without much hesitancy if there is an no if, uh, generally we don't want a patient to be having any kind of sepsis uh, when we are taking up for surgery but sepsis also is not an absolute contraindication if, for example if a patient also has if a patient has a positive blood culture even then some studies have said that okay you can take the lung but because it's a systemic disease and not lung is per se not affected by it there are various studies i can I'll, i'll keep showing those studies uh, later on uh, and uh, an ideal donor is where there is no previous cardiopulmonary surgery being performed on the patient this is uh, uh, very important especially if the patient uh, has uh, uh, because whenever 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 the chest is opened up for any reason there will be a lot of additions which form and that will hamper the further retrieval of the donor so one has to have a very clear history of whether there was a chest tube place whether there was some abscess drained when whether there was some uh, thoracotomy done or a vats done it's it, it is generally considered ideal if they don't have any of that and uh, uh, the sputum test should be uh, absent for any gram negative uh, organisms or gram positive organisms uh just yesterday we had to uh, reject a organ because of a multi drug resistant organism so one has to be very very be for a very strict protocol of uh, testing using pneumonia panel and uh, gram staining so we know we generally reject a lot of uh, donors because of this and which is which is very prudent because an ideal donor is where the sputum is negative for any organisms and uh, you also uh, confirm this by doing a bronchoscopy taking the uh purulent secretions on the bronchoscopy if it's absent then it's considered an ideal donor and generally the variation of abno- uh, anatomy doesn't really matter so much in terms of lung transplant compared to the liver one because the lung transplant the anatomy is more or less pers- uh, uh, straightforward you don't have to really worry about it only maybe if there is a right sided arch or some uh, abnormal anomalous uh, origin of the uh, uh, artery coming from the aorta or something unless you suspect something like that you are not worried much about the anatomical aspects of the lung but it, in general what is considered is if your right upper lobe bronchus is very close to the trachea uh, the uh, tracheal origin uh, the bifurcation of the trachea uh, of, uh, of the carina then it's considered to be a little challenging because you might lose out the you might narrow the upper lobe uh, bronchus while doing the anastomosis that's the only anatomical abnormality uh, which you are worried when you're doing when you are considering a donor for transplant and since now we are in an era, era where we are uh, going to other places other states to retrieve lungs one has to always look at one thing that is the estimated ischemia time uh, and ideally it should be less than 6 hours just because when we are getting a lung you should not fly over for 10 hours and try to get a lung from somewhere else that's really not worth it because you're just going to increase the uh, uh, pgd uh, of the patient if the ischemia time is longer now i'll put up few areas where it, there is a gray zone where we are not sure what to be done exactly and there are no specific guidelines to these conditions for example if a patient is smoking tobacco we know okay if more than 20 years is not fit but if he is smoking marijuana what should be done should we really consider him or not is there really gray zone only uh, with time we'll get to know whether it is uh, going to hamper how it's going to hamper unless some really good systematic studies are done to see their effect we will not be able to identify anything wrapping again very similar scenario no data as such uh, cocaine no no data and uh, if a patient has a minor uh, lung contusion and a, a small pneumothorax should we consider them should we consider them for transplant is a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer because you are doing such a major surgery you are giving him a suppressants if there is a pneumothorax or a lung contusion how will the lung behave after the transplant uh, is going to be a very difficult question sometimes uh, many of this high volume centers where you have very sick patients you might tend to take these lungs because okay you know okay there's a small contusion maybe i just wedge it out and see if 
the rest of the lung behaves well again you're adding another stapler line there so another another potential signs of uh, site of leak for your uh, uh, recipient lung uh, which again can hamper the outcome not in terms of any major things but yeah post operative leak and prolonged icd can be a problem so uh, uh, that's one of the things which you should remember the uh, most uh, important uh, answers are given by, by bronchoscopy in the pre operative period uh, sometimes we get straight forward answers sometimes we don't uh, questionable signs like uh, the questionable scenarios are when there is you feel that okay there is signs of aspirations but uh, you're not sure whether it was just a or uh, just some uh, pulling up pulling pulled up secretions or this action in infection and a presence of atelectasis as i discussed if it's a persistent atelectasis despite clearance or it was just a small uh, uh, because of the mucus plug and once you remove that the lung expands very difficult to say in these scenarios whether you're going to be uh, sure that the lung is good enough or not again there are few more examples previous cardiac surgery without opening the pleura another Uh, gray area whether how much the lung will uh, how much the surgery will impact for example uh, uh, it's not just the uh, pleura in fact we have to open the pericardium and uh, if patient has some pericarditis in the past whether it's a good idea to take those lungs is again a challenge because the donor uh, lobectomy uh, so donor uh, retrieval becomes difficult in case if there's a patient who had a uh, pleura, uh, pericarditis or constructive pericarditis and if patient has a suspicion of a uh, sepsis in terms like for example yesterday we had a case where the procal was high so we are more worried uh, whether that infection will be carried on to the uh, recipient lung which is al- already a susceptible uh, individual so we have to be much more cautious and we have to we have to weigh, weigh the risks and benefits before we offer a surgery for such patient and uh, uh, for some uh, in some cases we see that they can be uh, contamination during the procedure itself in india we have a we cannot use a new bronchoscope every uh, in every patient the patient cannot afford so much so we use the most sterilized uh, bronchoscopies to conduct uh, pre operative bronchoscopies in donors so sometimes you might have contamination where they show benign organisms where you have to neglect and go ahead if if you are like there is a multi drug resistant organism then you have no choice you have to reject the organ so that's one more scenario we have to look into when you are doing an assessment of the donor sometimes you have mucopurulent secretions which are questionable uh, very difficult to say whether those patients should be picked up or not now with uh, what has happened is with the increase in the wait list there is a pressure mounted on us to treat patients in a better way in terms of giving an of, of, offering them a, a solution because if a patient is on high flow nasal cannula or if he's on a bipap for one month or two month then the pressure is on the surgeon and the transplant team to give us result to them give an uh, option to them to undergo a uh, transplant uh, so in that case in that case we we have to uh, see how we can help the patients uh, especially if it's uh, so in this in this scenario we have to consider extended criteria the extended criteria uh, is first one one thing we have to understand is extended criteria doesn't mean we are compromising on the quality of lung we are just taking the lungs beyond the ideal criteria so it doesn't mean we are compromising on the quality of lung when we when we retrieve the organ it's not that uh, that uh, bad it's not that as it sounds it's not it's not like marginal it's not like a marginal lung which you have taken it is just that it's beyond the criteria which has been uh, put up by the uh, unos so the first thing in that is the uh, age age beyond uh, 55 years is considered to be an extended criteria uh, donation after ca- circulatory death uh, dcd is again uh, extended criteria pf ratio of less than 300 is considered to be a uh, extended criteria i mean, uh, when we look at the analysis uh, and in fact we have our own three clinical experiences where if the pf ratio is less than 300 and when we think okay we might give a chance at this lung because the ct is looking good the bronchoscopy is looking good then what we do is we uh, 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 open the chest and allow the lung to fully expand for 5 minutes and then do an abg if the abg is showing 400 and more than 300 for in fact then we are more than happy to take that lung because that means we know that it was due to the 
underlying collapse for which the lung was not suitable at that point. But when we had seen the CTs, X-rays were clear, the CT was fine. The history wasn't really contributing much to the, uh, other, the other factors were all right. Then we can do that. And then uh, if the, uh, there's again, a smoking history is uh, uh, one more thing. I, it's part of the extended criteria. Again, in, if you want to take a patient who is a smoker, more than 20 years, then again, you have to look at the other parameters, whether the PF ratio is good, whether the uh, lungs are fine on the CT, there is no impeachment of changes. And if you can ask a brief history of how is his performance status, maybe that might help. But more importantly, you look at bronchoscopy, you look at PF ratio, and you look at uh, the uh, CT scan and see okay, if other things are fine. Maybe his history cannot be the only predicting factor. You don't have to rely too much on that, or, or maybe just you can say, okay, he is otherwise okay, but we can uh, leave that uh, fact. Not, not everyone who has uh, smoked 20 years is going to die. So it's the same, like, same way here. So another thing is if a patient has a chest trauma and the chest tube has been placed, generally they are considered to be uh, a, a plus minus for transplant and uh, they, they fall under extended criteria. If there is a clear sign of aspiration and dense pneumonia, uh, you cannot take that lung. But there is there are few studies which have shown that even though if the consolidation is confined to one lung, they can be candidates for unilateral lung transplant. If the other lung is not flooded with any uh, secretions and the other lung is healthy, uh, you have to do a lot of uh, further testing, especially uh, you have to do selective venous sampling of the pulmonary vein to see if the left, if the other lung is, is having a good PO2 by FiO2 ratio. If that is fair enough, then you might consider those patients for single lungs. Uh, if patient has fewer leukocytosis, positive culture and sepsis, uh, they are generally considered no, unless you have a very dying patient uh, in your uh, ECMO services who needs this lung to be transplanted. Uh, and I, as I so told, the uh, anatomical abnormality of right upper lobe bronchus very close to the trachea can preclude your uh, uh, this thing because you might lose your upper lobe while doing the anastomosis because it's, it's, if it's too close, then your uh, sutures will just block the upper lobe bronchus. So you have to be very careful. And uh, uh, some fancy things of uh, uh, having an estimated uh, ischemia time of more than six hours are generally avoided to uh, give a better lung distance. So this is about extended criteria. So now I'll just discuss few param few things which are uh, helpful in our day-to-day -day, uh, recognition and identification of the uh, donors, good donor. So the first thing is age. Uh, increased use of donors has been noted in Europe. Almost 34% of donors are more than 55. And 21% of uh, donors are more than 60. So that itself shows that there has been an increasing tendency to take more and more extended donors, not in terms of other things, in terms of age. That means age should not be a barrier because uh, the longevity of life is increasing and the life expectancy is increasing. So is the donor age. So one has to be more receptive about this fact and accept more and more donors, even if they are a little older, if other parameters are all fine. So, uh, one of the things uh, when we look at that is how well are these donors going to do? If the if it's a very old donor with a lower percentage of smoking history and if he has a shorter ventilatory period, that is less than three days, then they are non-inferior. To, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to say that they are superior, you have to do a very large, uh, you should have a very large sample size. Since they don't have such huge numbers of donors who are more than 70, we even a non ferritary trial can be taken as a good example and I think we should, it should, it's a good thing to do it. And uh, usage of donors who are aged more than 70 years is safe and has been shown to have better functional outcomes when used in emphysema patients. For example, if a patient is waiting for you in, in a wait list who has emphysema, maybe they have a better chance of doing well with the, there's a patient of more than 70 years. One of the things is we have, we have uh, the studies have shown is if there is an older donor and an older recipient, that's a bad recipe. That means no one's going to make it. I mean, the donor, the recipient survival is very poor when we transplant an older lung. I mean, there are multiple variables for why it has happened, why it happens. But yes, we have to keep this in mind that if you have an older donor, you try to get a younger, uh, so older recipient, then try to get a younger lung and not the other way around. 
and uh, risk of if the risk of uh, death while waiting for lung transplant is very high then you are you are justified in taking a even an older lung okay so that's one thing and then uh, we have, there are a lot of studies which showed that the 10 year mortality increases uh, with the recipient age while donor age has very <laughs> limited impact so this is uh, a very uh, interesting study by chambers so what they have noted is the age of the donor per se isn't really the most important factor it is the underlying lung the uh, functions in terms of uh, pft and uh, sorry uh, pf ratios and bronchoscopy and ct which determine the uh, outcome rather than the age alone so in fact what they say is the recipient age if it's more that's more detrimental than the donor age so uh, this is a very important message which comes around across this is age of the recipient uh, age of the donor is not the most important criteria and uh, in terms of uh, patients on ventilator uh, prolonged ventilation and uh, tracheostomy are red flags but not absolute contraindications since we have prolonged uh, patients are on prolonged ventilator that is more than 7 days uh, we have they develop uh, basal atresis and mucus plug resulting in suboptimal gas exchange uh, somehow we have been very lucky in this regard because whenever uh, donor calls we are getting they are less than 4 days and on average we are that is 3 to 4 days is our average uh, a ventilatory period before we get a call that itself uh, signifies our robust program which we are running here so uh, one has to be uh, uh, very wary of this and uh, that's why as i told you earlier if there is uh, frank uh, purulent secretions with immediate pooling from distal airways that means there is pneumonia and those lungs are not good and if the pf ratio is more than 400 and a recent uh, ct scan just shows atelectasis even if the ventilatory period is more than 7 days you can take those lungs without much worry and uh, this is a very interesting study which we, i came across and uh, what what they have studied is how many lung uh, donors are rejected because of one strict criteria that is pf ratio because when we as a team will when we look when we look at pf ratio if it is less than 300 we straight away say okay maybe this is not the ideal one we may not we may wait for a better lung as a team uh, we have seen that this is what we follow but then when uh, the assessment has been done in uh, uh, various large studies they have seen that if the pf ratio is not great intraoperatively you ventilate the lungs take a take a pf ratio intraoperatively assess assess the pf ratio there if it is good then you consider this especially if it you can take a pulmonary vein sample and do the analysis i think that gives a very uh, a very uh, fair idea of how exactly it is because in the icu you are taking samples from the arterial line there might be some variation not much but there's some variation and this gives us a very uh, uh, this give one this gives a lot of hope that we might be able to retrieve more and more of lungs when we follow it when we take them to the when when we open up the chest as uh, as allow the lung to expand fully cure all the uh, try to resolve all the atelectasis by valsalva and uh, then do a uh, then, then do an abg and see if it really improves if it improves then that lung might be good enough if all the other parameters are fine so what we are understanding here is it's not just one parameter or two parameters if maybe one of them doesn't fit we might not be disheartened by it we might still go ahead with it if all the other parameters are in favor of a do good donor again multi drug resistant staph aureus or multi drug resistant bacteria with an evidence of extensive uh, pneumonic bars on the ct definitely you are not going to take that lung you know that there is an infection there is a proven uh, organism if it's absence uh, if, if if the uh, radiological signs are not there but still you have a culture what many of the higher high volume centers have taken these lungs they have run transplant and they, what they have seen is there has not been any significant impact on the 30 day mortality nor on the pgd nor on icu stay so why we have to also take a judgmental call on such patients when there is not a significant evidence of uh, uh, infection on ct scan or an x ray so this is a, a very uh, important uh, message here and uh, positive blood cultures per se are not a contraindication for transplant the recipient should receive appropriate antibiotics during the peri transplant period to minimize the potential risk of transmission of infection so the the idea behind this is it's a blood stream infection and not confined to lung and we have to give them a shot at uh, you we give coverage of antibiotics and hope that they don't have increased in risk of infections 
many centers where they are doing such cases with huge taking a huge risk they have found reasonably good rates of uh, survival as well as infection free periods so uh, this is about infection once it comes to malignancy whether a previous malignancy can preclude your transplant very few malignancies can be accepted for transplant they are generally uh, skin malignancies or, or cervical in situ cancers or primary cns tumors where they have not done any vp shunting or anything because if you do a vp shunting then there can be a chance of a metastasis to the other organ in a delayed period so uh, these are the only few cancers where a patient can be considered for uh, lung transplant donation any other cancers they are straightforward no and if a patient has received previous radiation or previous he has received bleomycin because bleomycin causes a lot of fib pulmonary fibrosis these patients again are not candidates for transplant so we have to be very careful when we assess the history of uh, malignancy in in trans in donation donors another interesting thing about uh, the uh, this thing uh, about donor donors is what is the cause of death whether he died of uh, trauma whether he died of hanging whether he died of drowning so these are our patient had an asthma and he died of that so we have to see all that if these these uh, causes may uh, help us in uh, one assessing the patient better in, in a focused assessment as well as also in seeing whether these patients can be taken for transplant or not for for example if a patient has trauma and a persistent pneumothorax he will not be suitable for surgery if he has a massive septicemia emphysema and there is early you really don't want to take these patients because you are adding another extra staple line the staple line healing is poor because of uh, the immunosuppressant you don't want to have a post operative complication which you cannot easily treat other other condition which we commonly see is dic because dic uh, is, is as is a result of uh, uh, may result in multi organ failure and most notably in uh, uh, acute lung injury so despite these some cases uh, where there is a where there is an absence of uh, serious thrombosis or hemorrhage they have taken up uh, lungs for these cases but it's generally in a very very selective environment where you have very high risk patient waiting in the wait list uh, this is an interesting uh, scenario we generally we are lucky that we haven't encountered such a something like this but if a patient if a donor has died of hanging what will happen to the airway whether the airway is fine enough to take or not whether the lungs are good enough to take or not is a is a question in mind so generally what happens is if there's a post obstructive barrett trauma which will uh, worsen uh, and it increases the alveolar capillary barrier and it increases capillary permeability so that means they lead to pulmonary edema and when they suddenly decompress it a prompt variation in uh, uh, venous return and intrathoracic pressure further leads to reperfusion edema okay so in both the things we have a very high pulmonary resistance very high uh, peak pressures and you have a very 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 uh, uh, susceptible lung for pulmonary edema these are patients where you don't want to take them okay even though all the criteria are fitting for your transplant you don't want to take this lung because in the post op period their cap the, the permeability is increased they have a very high chance that they land up in pulmonary edema in the post operative period Uh, another interesting scenario is where the patient has died due to drowning whether can we take this donor again drowning affects lungs there is a uh, uh, involuntary uh, breathing which happens there is rise in alveolar co2 and uh, you have severe laryngeal spasm and then you have uh, aspiration of gastric contents so you have either aspirating aspiration of the fluid that's called wet drowning or it is due to gastric contents that's uh, dry drowning if uh, one good part about this is this is all uh, airway disease and not parenchymal disease so if it's if the airway is clear these patients may be very very suitable for transplant but it's a very rare scenario where we find such a donor in, our, in today's era having a we are dying due to drowning and then we are assessing them for transplant it's a very rare scenario so one of the interesting uh, uh, scenarios is uh, asthma whether asthmatic patients are suitable for transplant or not generally if you look at it asthma is a uh, uh, neurotransmitter disease there is a hyperreactive airway disease 
so you have a lot of uh, uh, if by doing a transplant you're actually denervating the lungs so if for example if you think it like like that maybe you feel like okay the donor the recipient may not have any problems uh, any similar problems to the patient so that is a very common thing one one has one thinks but if a patient has died due to asthma or if he's on many medications then they are not very good candidates as such because they have a very hyperreactive airway disease they have elevated uh, pulmonary artery pressure they are susceptible for uh, uh, pulmonary edema so they are not very good patients for uh, donation the, if the donor has just a history of asthma and he is not on any treatment or rarely he needs treatment if he has or is having excise induced asthma then these patients can be classified as moderate risk and then taken up for donation so that is all about the uh, uh, physiology of the uh, donate donors now we look at the anatomy whether there is a size discrepancy which uh, matters for example if uh, when we look at when we assess the donor the thing we look at is is there a suitable recipient for this donor for this height for his uh, uh, total lung capacity so uh, i i am using the new term this is a total lung capacity which we generally calculate using various parameters if the total lung capacity of the donor is suitable for the recipient or near suitable to the recipient only then they are considered for donation because if there is a large discrepancy there will be uh, the anastomosis uh, will be difficult then there will be increased chance of uh, stenosis and dehiscence if it's too small then there is increased chance of pneumothorax there is increased chance of pneumothorax because the whole uh, tamponade effect of the lung is gone if there's a very small for size lung and the uh, and uh, the, there is also bleeding while if it's a too larger lung for a small patient especially for young ladies we see that the chest cavity is small and then if you have to place a larger lung you are worried about that uh, wound infections wound complications and even leaving behind the chest and even if you want to reduce do some lung volume reduction on the donor the problem again is the staple line because uh, you are leaving the you are always in the back of your mind you are worried about leak from the staple line which can be very catastrophic at times so we have seen that in patient with ipf the chest becomes smaller in copd the chest becomes bigger uh, in in ipf we see that the diaphragm is moved up the rib spaces are very crowded the total lung capacity per se is reduced with time and as the disease progresses they become smaller and smaller this is a very difficult challenge and that's why overall also when you look at emphysema and uh, ipf the survival with emphysema is better than ipf because of this because one of these reasons is this and in in uh, copd uh, the due to emphysema the changes the chest cavity is larger the diaphragm is flatter and the rib spaces are widened and the total lung capacity increases so now what is an to ideal total lung capacity for a man it is uh, 7.99 into height in, in meters minus 7.08 so this is a very standard calculation which has been uh, formulated after various trials and for a woman it is uh, 6.69 into height minus 5.79 and uh, the ideal donor to recipient ratio is considered to be 1 or nearby 1 if it is less than 1 it is considered undersized if it's more than 1 it is considered oversized so uh and uh, if the a good allograft is considered one which is between 75 to 125% that is 0.72 point, point 0.75 to 0.125 of the ratio is a good sized lung for any patient and uh, with the caveat that larger organs uh, are preferred uh, with to for patients with preoperative hyperinflation and smaller organs are uh, uh, preferred for patients with the preoperative restrictive restrictive impairment now uh, one thing i want to uh, say is specifically for india this these all these criteria are made from west where uh, the uh, even the average height of a lady is taller they have uh, uh, they, this thing is uh, their built is a little more than the indian uh, built in the average indian height of ladies would be somewhere around 5.2 where there it is 5.7 or 5.8 uh, so that itself is a very uh, uh, variable one so uh, as of now we don't have any such criteria for uh, asian or indian population and I, i seriously we have to look into that aspect how we can uh, change that and uh, apart from that uh, one other thing is uh, uh, in terms of uh, when you look at the criteria for donation we have an opt in option in our country where one has to opt in 
okay and in various western uh, 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 societies they are coming up with an option of opt out that means you have to mandatorily go and opt out to donate if you do that only then your organ is not retrieved otherwise by law they're going to take your organ once you die of any disease i think you slowly as a society we have to make that change and try to inculcate an option of opting out rather than opting in in opting in we have seen that there are multiple confounding factors which run in and uh, which allow us which prevent us from donating organs whereas in an opt out option you have to you have to be very sure that you don't want to donate because there is a kind of a societal responsibility also towards you to opt out of a opt out from being a uh, organ donor so by this i end my talk thank you uh thank you dr manjunath sir uh, for the very lucid and elaborative uh, talk about what an ideal donor is thank you so uh, like before going into further more discussion uh, as per the data the rate of donation or like uh, organ donation in india is less than 1 per million population yeah, yeah, yes. so when compared to developed countries where it is somewhere around 20 to 30 per million yeah. population yes. so i mean less than 1 again is a big number if you actually precisely look at the number is just 0.52 as per the data Yes. which is way beyond like developed countries yes. so what do you think uh, is a reason behind this in india or any other developing countries see what the main the reason, yeah the main reason is i think uh, acceptance of uh, a social, social responsibility i can say to donate an organ by the patient as well as by the relatives i think okay. both the ways they have a tendency to say no to it especially in india in village side we see that if you ask them okay you want to donate the, uh, your uh, kin or kids uh, uh, organs they say okay you're going to just cut open everything and then leave it like that see they have a very negative attitude towards uh, donation mainly because they feel okay you're going to rip through your uh, relatives organs and that is something which has to change with good education and good uh, uh, propagation by the government also because it's not a one person or one uh, unit's responsibility i think as a society we have to do it yeah and i think it is like majorly uh, religious taboo also yes. in india and developing countries when it comes to organ donation but yeah thanks to all this uh, organ donation portals in our country for continuous uh, like for creating awareness continuously and i'm glad we have jivandar in telangana which has the highest organ donation to the country officially yeah so i come to add the uh, data from a hospital so uh, from our hospital in last 3 uh, years the statistics has been uh, in 2011 we had 31 donations in 2020 or uh, 2022 21 we had 33 donations 2022 we had 44 donations and this year we have already reached uh, 21 so i am hoping that this year it will be better than last year in terms of uh, organ donations and transplants so uh, we are very happy that we are part of this organization where we have maximum donations in our country yeah so but the unfortunate part is out of all the organ donations the rate of choosing lung is only 20% yes. and that is when you actually stick to the ideal donor criteria and that is the reason we are talking about extend, extended donation criteria yes. sir uh, my question to dr rashish sir can you un unmute yeah 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 please dr rashish sir yes yeah so dr manjana sir already uh, uh, mentioned about this point uh, just to reiterate so if there is a donor who has a history of previous cardiac surgery do we still accept him as a donor and if we accept what are the practical challenges that we face uh, see when uh, like um, in in current scenarios when we are uh, struggling with availability of donors uh, and we are uh, we know that uh, probably for a end stage uh, lung disease lung transplant is the only available solution as of now so uh, we would we would if 
if the team is competent and if like uh, we are uh, ready to extend uh, our uh, challenges then uh, i think we can go ahead with uh, accepting a patient uh, as a donor who has undergone previous cardiac surgery but then said the, uh, having said this it's not that easy as it would go in a setting when we have a patient without any previous intervention so we should be ready with technical challenges and the challenges is not just like uh, when the pleura is opened and we are thinking in terms of lung adhesions but here we also need to because most of the time we are going to be exposed in a situation where it is going to be a multi organ heart arrest so our responsibility also would be to maintain uh, circulation to other organs so being a redo procedure we can even hamper uh, this aspect of the procedure by having a hemodynamic compromises because of our manipulation during dissection or during during a, when we do a redo sternotomy or when we do dissection so even other organs may get affected so at this point uh, we should take a judicious decision early phases of uh, probably in sec- and transplant i would personally avoid uh, going for an uh, redo uh, donors uh, but in experience center it has not been a contraindication and probably very few reports have been published one of them is published the largest series by oxford uh, which they, i think they, out of some if i remember it around 400 odd uh, they have reviewed 400 odd donors uh, in which only 12 were uh, redos uh and they have offered a, a fairly decent uh, results but again uh, it it will be center to center a choice with uh, having an uh, uh, pre decided uh, idea that it is going to be a challenging task it may affect the other uh, organ uh, retrievals as well and uh, yes if 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 all the things can work well then uh, it, there is no real Uh, indications to uh, reject the donor uh, yeah so i think the, yeah so i think the point is made clear that you can accept such donors depending on the efficiency of your transplant unit and the transplant yeah. surgeon and also depending on the urgency of requirement or the yeah. uh, uh, criticality okay. of your Absolutely. recipient yeah thanks for bringing out this actually i missed out on this this is a very important point because when we are extending our uh, selection criteria at that point of time we, we need to discuss or have a uh, idea about two important points from the respect recipients perspective as how sick the uh, the recipient is i mean we can take all the risk only if we know that our recipient is so sick that uh, and we can we can extend our horizons for selection of donors and at the same time the second uh, thing is we should speak to the recipient as, uh, as well if he is willing to accept a donor which is uh, which might be a little uh, beyond the ide- ideal or beyond the optimal donor so willingness of the recipient as and the clinical condition of the recipient also would guide us to take the appropriate decision in this kind of uh, thanks for bringing this up thank you so uh, dr rashika sir i would like to ask you the next question so what is the role of a bronchoscopy while evaluating a donor and what actually would you see when you do a bronchoscopy and on what basis would you accept or reject a donor while doing a bronchoscopy thank you chetan uh, and first of all i would like to say that uh, dr manjuna has given a very nice talk i congratulate him for the nice talk he has completely covered it and regarding the pre transplant bronchoscopy uh, it is considered uh, mandatory by some teams but if the pf ratio is more than 300 with a good chest x ray with the ventilation less than 3 days old uh, bronchoscopy need not be performed that is one but uh, sometimes pre op bronchoscopy may give us an idea about for example uh, epic trachea or uh, bronchus trachea this kind of anatomical abnormalities may be detected which will help a surgeon to plan for surgery that is one the other uh, point here is majority of these uh, uh, lung donor patients on pre op bronchoscopy we can see mucopurulent secretions it is non rather than exception and what is bothering what is going to bother a transplant team is reaccumulation or repooling of the secretions after evacuation by bronchoscope 
So if that is there, then probably we'll have to do pneumonia panel, gram stain, ZN staining, especially in India. Uh, I, I prefer to do a ZN staining to rule out uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis infection as well. So I would uh, think that I would suggest pre-transplant pre bronchoscopy is a must, especially in teams where uh, we are just going to establish our programs and uh, the uh, and the lung donor uh, lung donor utilization rates uh, in multi-organ donation donors is about uh, less than thirty percent. So there is a severe shortage of lung donors. So we have to take all precautions possible to make sure that even if uh, the donor lung uh, matches the extended criteria, we will have to use that lung to get the best outcomes. So my preference would be to do a, have a com compulsory pre transplant bronchoscopy to look for the anatomy as well as for the secretions part. So thank you so much sir, for making it clear and also appreciate you for emphasizing the point of working up a tuberculosis in a donor because India is an endemic country and you never know what you're dealing with it. Even the recipient and donor are always at high risk of developing tuberculosis. Thank you so much for that, sir. Uh, Dr. Manjunath, sir, yeah, please. You, you mentioned about size matching when choosing a donor and you spoke about predicted TLC ratios. So, as we all know, all these predicted TLC ratios are from the Western literature and they're not done on an Indian population basis or any other country basis. Yes. So, do you want to still stick to the predicted TLC ratios or is there anything that we practice in your uh, institute? Uh, those are the, these are, this is the uh, uh, standard of uh, uh, evaluating a donor. But uh, even if you are uh, calculating the AP diameter and the uh, transverse diameter and the overall this thing, I think that will be enough for many of our patients rather than completely sticking to one thing. So, yeah, my question to both the expert panelists, in fact, it's not a question, probably a comment from both of you. So, uh, I think there are there is enough literature to say that the results from an extended donor are non-inferior to an ideal donor. Yeah. And as we already discussed, if we stick to an ideal donor, the chances of accepting lungs are very low, less than 20%. So uh, like most of the programs in India uh, have been like three to five years old, like properly established. So what do you opine about this? Are we ready to accept extended uh, donors for our transplant programs? Or is there any other way to go ahead with this? Both of you can uh, please let us know your comments on this. Yeah. Um, can I? Dr. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, like we are medical professionals, basically, the so called extended uh, uh, criteria for uh, lung donor, I think we need to accept more so because majority of our uh, lung transplant, potential lung transplant recipients, they may be on ventilator or some people may be on ECMO, especially during the recent pandemic, uh, you must have seen a lot of patients were on ECMO waiting for uh, organs to be available. So in these situations, we basically, like Dr. Ashish mentioned, we need to educate and counsel the family clearly about the risks involved and the urgency to do transplant, accepting the, uh, the borderline gray zone donors. I think that is the way forward for us. Because unless we test the boundaries, we will not progress further in the program. So we will have to accept these marginal donors and we will have to proceed. This is my personal opinion. Any of your comments, sir? Ashish, sir? Sir, I agree. I agree fully with Rajika, sir. Um, we, uh, we need to uh, extend uh, our donor criteria. Uh, and then again, uh, with... Uh, with based on what is the recipient status of recipients, uh, that is very important. Because if our recipient is stable and we can wait, then uh, then probably we might wait for a um, if if I mean if can give a better donor choice. But when recipient condition is like uh, in, uh, is enforcing us for early surgery, then probably I think we should not. Uh, and if they are willing, then we should go ahead with uh, extended marginal criteria. Uh, but uh, having said that, there are certain things like uh, we should um, also incorporate in our 
this in our experience again as uh, majnat uh, has said um, that uh, all these data comes from western literature so uh, they they have uh, they are extending criteria they are managing it but we might have our limitations so we should judge that and especially in terms of infections like that is going to be our major problem so even if uh, extended criteria says that if we have an so already existing source of bacteria equivalent uh, bronchoscopy secretions and we know that we, uh, the organism is sensitive to particular antibody but still i would be having my reservations in in this situation or if if there is an evidence of sepsis or if there is evidence of massive trauma uh, of the lungs i would i would still have my reservations in 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 terms and would not void unless it's like really uh, requiring for the for the patient so so all those criteria i would not take it as they are mentioned here but probably we would have to give a brainstorming sessions uh, uh, and think how the overall outcome would be so basically even if it's marginal as as we all know it, it is marginal but it is not bad so we should not uh, we should make a just make a judicious decision here like how to and what to accept depending on recipient and available to so one thing i want to add is uh, if you say extended criteria doesn't uh, actually mean a bad lung it is just a Uh, the, it is not just meeting the criteria, but doesn't exactly uh, com- commensurate with the bad lung uh, transplant. That's all. Yeah. And uh, like so far in India, and also in many other developing countries, we have been uh, relying only on donations of the brain death or the the DPT donors. So to increase the do- donor pool, the Western world has incorporated DCT donors, that is donations after surgery death. But unfortunately, our laws and logistics do not allow us. So do you think, I mean, what do you see at it? Like in the future, will we be able to do DCT donors or do we have to do anything to get DCT donors in our country? Because that is a major uh, thing. It is shown to improve donor pool by at least 30% in other Western countries. And we are lacking there. Okay, so, uh, so DCD donation. I, I was working in Pepper uh, in UK. So it is one of the center which does a high number of DCD heart as well as DCD lungs. So we have done, and uh, results are very good uh, with DCD uh, lungs. The problem with DCD lung is um, we uh, we can evaluate lungs very well. Actually, it's a major problem for heart uh, transplants because. Uh, it is like an arrested heart which you take. But however, lung is a little more resilient organ than uh, heart, so it's not that bad. So results of DCD are definitely good. Another uh, thing that we look forward is if we have an um, like an extra corporal uh, support uh, EVLP, so wherein we can mount the organ and we can uh, functionally evaluate the organ over a period of time. and where we can manipulate the organ a bit like suppose we have a patient who's got a lung which is congested and when we go and find that this is a congested lung and we are not able to take it for a transplant then we mount it on a machine and we can actually take out the fluid for like say for 3 4 hours and then we can try and see if functional if the functional of lung improves and then we can try to use it so these two areas like dcd and evlp might be a future uh, areas where we can increase our uh, donor pool the other thing which uh, as you said in dcd situation in india actually if you see i mean uh, don't quote me as a, this but in dcd we are actually waiting for uh, the death to happen because that's how it's a circulatory death where patient is has got intact brain uh, brain stem so th- these ethical issues will have to be uh, addressed uh, in indian setup where no proper uh, uh, proper uh, guidelines are not i mean still we are i think in uh, process of uh, trying to get this setup done in india but in near future it will come because every uh, where uh, it is coming up so india is not going to be behind so once this ethical issues are properly sorted out uh, i think uh, it it is good actually it has, it has given good results as competent as dbd in both in heart transplant and lung transplant only thing is we might have to have more access to these newer technologies of ocs and evl team to uh, do better things so one final question before we close sir dr rajshekar sir so like in india obviously as we have been discussing the major challenges about organ donation be it because of religious taboos or lack of education or uh, unawareness of uh, the importance of organ donation 
So what do you think can we do to improve the donation rate in our country? Because we have a huge burden of end-stage lung diseases awaiting transplants. And to match that need, we need like way more number of donors than what we have now and how to go ahead with it, what to do. <laughs> We need uh, uh, we need to educate public basically. That's what Manjunath also mentioned earlier. But more important is now that the social media is available. You know the television and uh, other media are quite available and the mobile and the WhatsApp university is there. Whenever you send a message, it goes across. And <laughs> I think uh, all uh, transplant teams, uh, all interested parties should take part in it to spread awareness among public about the need to donate organs and they should sign a donor card because signing a donor card is the first step. I think uh, we should involve uh, the voluntary organizations, NGOs and Mohan Foundation and other, other uh, uh, organizations which have a stake in organ donation, uh, take their help, be part of the entire uh, thing to spread awareness among public. And um, that is the way to go. I, I believe that is the way to go because in India, most of the people, I mean, majority of the people, uh, you know, they, they follow. Uh, sometimes they follow blindly. So we will have to spread awareness among people, like even for the religious uh, head, sometimes they have to, you know, they have to give you uh, that, uh, uh, they have to educate and give message to their followers that uh, organ donation is a must and it has to be adopted improve lives and save their life. Yeah. So finally, any closing remarks from both of you, sir? Yeah, I, uh, I, Chetan, uh, I, sir. Pointed out, I you, sir. had a small query. See, uh, see, when we speak about a extended donor, on, uh, there is a small a a area like where we may have a possible hepatitis B, or C positive donor. So, so uh, uh, what to be your strategy when you be a, a have a hepatitis B or C donor? Any any experiences from your end, uh, I think a positive to positive donor is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. the donor and disability both are positive. Then that is a go ahead. But definitely not a positive to negative. This is my personal uh, this thing. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I agree. Well, I agree with yeah, yeah. So even in Upward, uh, do do would they have the same policy? Like uh, I I I I read a lot about people saying you can start antivirals. You have an antiviral regime and. Uh, they just go ahead. Yeah, you know, we used to do, uh, do what I did again, subject to consent and uh, if willingness is there, only then. Because these uh, things are all to be uh, explained to them. If there is a, so there is a normal consent form and then there is extended criteria consent form and then there is HIV, HCV uh, consent form, uh, which is, I mean, not HIV, but HCV consent form, uh, which is separate uh, which wherein uh, the recipient is given information about the possible outcomes and problems. Uh, and then uh, if they are willing, but usually this consent doesn't happen uh, in a non-HCV uh, positive. Okay. Yes. And uh, another another query I had, which I like to comment on. Uh, see, we always say the ideal ischemia time is six hours, but practically, uh, by the time I may implanted your second lung, the ischemia time is like around eight hours. So, so the, does that really make a huge difference if you are per fusion, per, you know, do on a lung per fusion and harvesting has been done in an ideal way? Uh, would you really be worried if you ischemia time is like eight hours or ten? And us. I think uh, I think it doesn't make a difference uh, because even in uh, Papat, uh, we used to have uh, ischemia time means the surgery time used to be around uh, six to eight hours. So the, it is to definitely exceed uh, the ideal time of uh, six hours. But by, by that time, your one lung at least is in. So maybe it's the uh, other lung which gets a little bit. 
not really uh, means not because of this really bad outcomes uh, we'll see. So thank, you, uh, yeah. 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 thank you uh, thank you uh, i just uh, wonderful to be uh, to have you uh, thank, in a, yeah. thank you so much thanks uh, so uh, i would i would once again thanks uh, dr manjunath for his uh, excellent presentation i think he has covered uh, every detail in a very easy to understand manner very nicely explained all Thank the you, ex, uh, points and most of the things. I think the main highlight over here is like uh, your recipient makes few important decisions for you. The clinical condition of recipient, wherein you get the liberties of extending your criteria. If your recipient is stable, then uh, then we still, I think we give what is best we can give for the recipient because lung transplant by itself uh, is not going to be as simple as uh, other transplant because the moment he starts breathing in India, he's going to have problem uh, because of uh, exposure to organisms and uh, which itself will increase the immunological uh, response to his lungs. So uh, based on recipients, I think that is the decision that you take as, as we all uh, know about it. And matching is another important area that uh, you have highlighted almost everything. But that is another important factor which will give you uh, uh, a good long-term outcome. And as you said, this matching based on uh, predicted TLC. So that uh, aspect alone is incomplete. And we should make use of uh, other supporting factors also, like what kind of pathology you are dealing with. If it's a fibrotic, we need to put an undersized lung. We cannot put in uh, more than uh, one uh, ratio lung in that uh, chest cavity because it is going to create problem. And, and when we say to reduce the lung size, it is easy to say, but then the outcomes of this added procedures are not going to be good. Similarly, if we have a emphysematous lung, we should try and avoid putting a smaller size lung, going for a bigger uh, size lung in, this, in these patients. So matching not only with the PTLC, maybe we should incorporate other things like X-ray dimensions, chest dimensions, patient's weight also, because then in that formula, the weight is not accounted. So we should give some uh, response towards the body surface area because that will determine the cardiac output. And we don't want a lung with flooding with blood if we have a high BSA patient because of weight. So, so it is like, uh, means we need to just have a look at these things also when we're making a decision, especially in, uh, when we are in a borderline situation. But excellent Point. presentation, thanks. So, Dr. Rashid, sir, are you there? Yeah. So, I think uh, uh, we shall conclude our session now. I thank our speaker, Dr. Manjanath Balisar, for taking all the efforts to talk even from the airport while catching his flight. And special thanks to our expert panelists, Dr. Rashid, sir, and Dr. Rashid, sir, for taking out their time to be with us here and sharing your valuable uh, experiences with us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. For with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I will close the session now.